Welcome to the year 1969. Nice. Of Soviet Space Program. In this episode, we have facility upgrades, a second lunar mission, as well as launching to new planetary bodies. To start the year, we have lots of time warping. But with a bit of video editing, we take ourselves to May 26, where the administration building completes to unlock the 10th program slot and gives us a much nicer building along with it. And now that the construction is completed, our funding has returned and allows us to finally hire back the engineers which were placed on temporary leave. Next, we'll start the mission training for the second lunar launch, warp to the completion of LC-5, and then turn our attention to Venus. The 28th of May, we switch over to Venera 4, as the probe is two days away from the Venusian capture. The trajectory to the planet is not quite where we want it, as the orbital permutation experiment on the craft requires a specific inclination to operate. A course correction is performed to adjust for this, and to hopefully get the orbiter over a new biome. Venera 4 is now anticipated to approach the planet at an altitude of 270 kilometers. And just like the probe before, it will execute a capture burn to place it into an elliptical orbit. Mission Control confirms Venera 4 has successfully entered into the required orbit, completing one of the two mission objectives. Next up, the probe follows through with a programmed sequence of events, beginning with the dropping of periapsis to 900 kilometers, and then reorienting itself to release the lander. Off screen, the carrier stage will reboost its orbit, and it will continue running its experiments as well as acting as a communications relay. A lander makes it through re-entry, which should come as no surprise, as it is no different than Venera 3. And just like its sister probe, it will fall gently through the thick atmosphere for over half an hour, collecting flying high and flying low science along the way. We do realize that we unfortunately have not landed inside a new biome, which means the science returns will be quite meager compared to the first mission. On top of that, the telemetry analysis will need to be force ran to get the contract completion for this mission. Is this considered an exploit? That I'm not too sure, but regardless, it's okay in my book. And we get the contract to be marked as completed. With that mission out of the way, we can now complete the Venus Surface Exploration Program. Since we have that extra program slot from the last admin upgrade, early Earth space stations can be accepted at the fast pace. The flight director position has opened up recently with the retirement of Vladimir Barman. To fill that opening, Deke Slayton is hired for the perk of reduced crew salaries. Hopping back out to the Space Center, we take note that the Mercury launch window will be coming up in mid-October, with the Vesta window following right behind it. It is here that 200 of the free applicants are onboarded to get the Soyuz LC to integrate a bit faster. Next, time is warped ahead four weeks to line our pockets with cash, and then into the VAB for the first Proton rocket. The Soyuz is going to have to share the center stage with a VA capsule, as this will be the mainstay for the station's program. The TKS in this case will be acting as our first space station, carrying with it the crew in this single launch configuration. For later flights, it will act as the primary resupply craft 
and ferry crew for rotations. The downside of flying the VA along the Soyuz is we now have to spend a bit more on the entry cost for this new capsule. And to make things worse, the station module we need for the crewed experiments is a hefty 220,000 credits. This was planned for, so there's enough unlock credit to cover those costs. And we then use the amassed funds to integrate the rocket. The LC will be starting heavily understaffed, beginning with the 300 remaining free applicants and the 80 new hired engineers. But with the daily budget window opened, we can confidently set auto hire to 1,000 and expect to reach that staffing level in three months. Speaking of which, this is the same time that our pair of R-56 are now rolled out and ready to fly the next crewed lunar mission. The engineers from the R-56 LC are no longer occupied, so we'll grab nearly 1,000 of them and shift them over to support the proton integration, maxing out that LC's staffing. At this time, the next upgrade for the tracking station is initiated, as it will help us out in our upcoming small bodies missions. On the 27th of September, we have the back-to-back -back R-56 launches for Mission 2 to the lunar surface. The success and learnings of the first moon landing have determined that the dual lunar orbit rendezvous architecture works quite well, and has confirmed that the lander has sufficient propellant margins to accommodate a multi-day lunar stay. Just as it was done in the previous year, the LKs launched first to confirm a successful orbital insertion. Following which, the crew lift off and ascend towards space. Strapped aboard the LOK for this mission are Yana, Vasily, and Tamara, the same crew who executed the first lunar orbit two years prior. Constant engine failures on the second stage seem to plague the R-56, as one has been experienced for each of the missions since its inception. Although it is a manageable problem, it is certainly becoming a bit of a nuisance. The next phases of the mission go smoothly. The LK performs a lunar transfer burn, followed shortly by the crew. The mission profile this time around will be trying out something a bit different. Instead of going for a retrograde capture that allows a free return trajectory, the crafts will instead enter into a prograde orbit. With both crew and lander in orbit, the LOK follows the standard protocol of getting an intercept with the LK. The cosmonauts succeed in executing a precise rendezvous, managing to get within 150 meters of the lander. The crew then set up their approach to align the two crafts and perform docking. The mission this time around will require a bit more planning, as the landing team will need to reach an accurate landing location in order to meet the contract objectives. With several landing sites to choose from, the one this crew will be aiming for is located within Oceanus Procellorum. Requiring to land no more than 10 kilometers from the target site, they will have to spend several hours in orbit until their flight path has them passing over the target zone. Fast forward eight hours. Yana and Vasily depart aboard the LK. 
Minutes later, they execute the 100 meter per second maneuver to initiate their descent. To help hit the target zone, the final landing burn will be plotted with Principia to determine where to reignite the crasher stage. From here, they will continue coasting until they reach the mark and fire up the engine. As they are descending to the surface, some corrections will be made via pitch and yaw to keep them on target. With less than one minute of fuel remaining, the cosmonauts notice that they are going to overshoot the target. The crasher stage does have some fuel reserves, so they will be able to correct for this overshoot and reverse their flight path back to the target. The RD-858 makes for easy work on the final descent, allowing the second group of cosmonauts to softly touch down on the lunar surface. Yana and Vasily waste no time beginning their lunar mission. Included as part of the exploration is a trek to the discarded crasher stage, which is located 350 meters from the landing site. Yana plays a visit to this expendable hardware while putting the spacesuit through its paces on this mini expedition. Completing all of their surface activities, the cosmonauts retire to the safety of their lunar lander, as it will serve as their home for the next 48 hours. Completing their lunar stay, the team initiates the ascent to begin their rendezvous with their crewmate in low orbit. A considerable amount of procession has occurred to the LOK over the past two days. So the lander will need to do a bit of a dogleg to meet back up with the orbiter. Achieving an initial 45 kilometer orbit the next step will be to execute a 125 meter per second inclination change to match planes with the LOK. The propellant reserves are nearing depletion after executing that last maneuver. But thankfully, the final burn will only require 37 meters per second to cancel the last of the relative velocities. Reunited once again, the cosmonauts transfer over any remaining consumables and surface samples before commanding the lander to perform a deorbit burn. The crew will remain in orbit for several more days, as they must wait for a return window which will place them on a path to re-enter within Soviet territories. After clocking in six full days in lunar orbit, the cosmonauts initiate the departure burn to set them on a course for home. Eleven and a half days into the mission, they are taking notice of their dwindling food supplies as well as life support. The LOK does have contingency for operating two days past the mission duration, but they didn't want to test those limits. Completing over 15 and a half days in space, the cosmonauts discard the service and orbital modules and begin re-entry for the return home. Whether it was a meticulously planned detail or simply pure luck, the re-entry profile happened to bring the crew almost to the doorsteps of the space center. A fitting end for this team of cosmonauts, having performed a targeted landing on the lunar surface and now a targeted landing back on home soil. Barely a week later, we watch as the Soyuz lifts off to send our first probe to the closest planet to the sun. 
The challenge with getting to Mercury is not due to communications range, but the large amount of Delta V needed to get an intercept. The small size of the probe means this will not be much of a problem. A little over 5,000 Delta V will be expended by the upper stage as it propels Mercury 1 towards its destination. With the burn completed, the probe decouples, and we will catch back up with it in about 120 days. The final launch we have is Vesta 1, taking flight on the 1st of December. As indicated by its name, this will be a mission to the asteroid Vesta, which is located in the belt just past the planet Mars. We are beginning to reach communication limits with this mission, but a boosted antenna strength will be enough to get data back to the Space Center. The farther distance from the Sun will also mean we need some bigger and stronger panels to power this probe. Completing the transfer burn, Vesta-1 is released from the Block L. Ground teams notice an anomaly with the telemetry readings, as the probe is showing a lack of power being generated by the panels. The team realizes that the solar tracking motors are not operating, meaning that the craft will only be able to generate only half of the planned wattage. For now, this is not much of a problem, as it is close to the sun. But in the next few days, the ground teams will have to transmit new instructions to the probe in order to enable the sun tracking for the panels. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next decade of Soviet Space Program. <laughs>